So the topic I want to address this morning is this one. The Bible and biology. How did we get here? Now, I want to consider three questions this morning. Okay. And the first one I want to consider is this. Why has evolution been so controversial among Christians? Now, you'll, you'll probably be able, you'd probably be able to give me 10 or 15 minutes worth or an hour's worth, even, of answers to that that would be accurate um, if you're involved in these issues and talking with your friends and your fellow Christians about these things. But I'll, I'll give you my take on that. Second, what do creation science or scientific creationism or young earth creationism, any of those terms would apply, what do uh, that view and the intelligent design perspective claim about God the Bible, and evolution. They are the two main alternatives out there on the landscape to the perspective Biologos is presenting today. And third, does the acceptance of evolution entail the denial of Orthodox Christianity? And I put the Orthodox with a small o here. In the, in the sense I'll, dis, I'll define later in the talk, I hope clearly, basically I mean the affirmation of the ecumenical creeds the Apostles and Nicene creeds, as recognizing the heart of our faith statements theologically as Christians. Now, the controversy has happened ever since Darwin, and even before Darwin, to some extent. I'm not going to talk about that part. But for Americans, I think the most important event was probably the Scopes trial, which happened in a very hot summer in 1925, exactly 90 years ago, in a small town in East Tennessee called Dayton. This is a famous posed photograph from that event, featuring the two most famous people who were part of it, neither of whom was there at the beginning. That is, when the trial began, or when the, the background to the trial, which would happen just a, a few weeks before the trial itself took place, featured the passage of an anti-evolution bill by the legislature in Tennessee, and it was signed into law by Democratic Governor Austin P., who never thought it would have to be enforced. He thought it was kind of a state of the public, of the state of the legislature's opinion type of statement. You know, gee, we're all, we're all for this. And, you know, technically it was a crime for a public school teacher to teach evolution or any theory contrary to the biblical theory of creation in the schools in Tennessee, including universities that were publicly funded. It was public, applied to all publicly funded education in the state of Tennessee. And it was one of many, many such bills that were discussed across the country, owing to the efforts of William Jennings Bryan, the man on our right in this photograph. A three-time former candidate for president as a Democrat, twice in the 1890s and once in the 20th century. Well. Yeah, twice in the 19th century. One of those years was 1900, which was the 19th century. And again, once in the 20th century. So a three-time unsuccessful candidate for president at the top of the ticket. A very progressive Democrat, held very liberal views on things like women's suffrage, Philippine independence, the direct election of United States senators, which was not provided for in the Constitution originally. He was. He felt that banks and other parts of the financial industry did not have the interest of the ordinary American at heart. He was essentially a socialist in some of his attitudes toward banking, believed in the public ownership of banks, for example. And he uh, was a pacifist during World War I and quit Woodrow Wilson's cabinet when he felt Wilson was duplicitously leading us into war. And so this is the kind of person he was in his political career. He was also a devout fundamentalist Christian. He identified with the fundamentalist wing of Christianity when that name emerged. The name fundamentalist was first used in the United States in the context of something called the fundamentalist modernist debate in 1920. It was coined in America in the context of pro Protestant, uh, Protestants arguing against other Protestants about how to understand the Bible and how to respond to modernity, including science. Brian became a leader in the fundamentalist wing of American Protestantism in the 1920s, and that's when he himself 
tried to persuade his political colleagues to ban the teaching of evolution in public schools. All of that led to a trial in Tennessee, a criminal trial, but everyone in the room, including the defendant, wanted a conviction so that they could put the law itself on trial in higher courts. They were not fully successful in that goal. That's a long story that I won't tell you any more about now. His opponent at that trial was also not there in the beginning, and that was Clarence Darrow on our left, the most famous criminal lawyer of the 20th century. A leading expert on this, Edward Larson, who's written the Pulitzer Prize winning book about the Scopes trial and who is a Christian, has told me that he thinks Darrow was far and away the greatest trial lawyer of the century and he made all the people involved in the O.J. Simpson trial you know, look like amateurs. He was an extraordinarily skilled courtroom attorney. He was extremely liberal in his political views, as was Brian, as I've already indicated. They were actually very similar politically, but religiously they couldn't be further apart. Darrow was technically an agnostic, that's what he, how he thought of himself, who was perceived publicly as an atheist, who loved to debate Christians and other religious people in the public square, literally in city parks, even one-on-one -on -one and in, in print. He went to Dayton because Brian had already gone to Dayton. Brian had gone to Dayton at the request of the first president of the world's Christian Fundamentals Association, William Bell Riley, a Baptist minister from Minneapolis, who asked Brian to go and help the prosecution. After all, Brian had campaigned for the passage of these laws. Brian went. After Brian was there, Darrow saw an opportunity to draw Brian into the public debate about religious issues. And so he went to Dayton, offered his services to John Scopes, who was already represented for free by the American Civil Liberties Union. They didn't want Darrow there, but Darrow took over the case. And that's basically what happened there. And that confrontation between Darrow and Brian that you see symbolized here in this photograph represents much, much of the history of the American Respond, religious response to evolution in the 20th century and now in the 21st century. It was indeed a confrontational age, religiously. How did fundamentalists, the people who chose that word themselves to describe their side, the conservative side in this religious battle that they were having with liberal Protestants about how to understand the Bible and theology, how did they perceive themselves? Well, they perceived themselves as under attack by forces of modernity which are identified as battleships in this cartoon from the leading fundamentalist periodical of the age, The King's Business, published out of Biola. Biola, of course, today, the word Biola University, the B-I-O-L-A stands for the Bible Institute of Los Angeles, which is what it was in the 1920s. And the dean of the faculty there, the great biblical scholar Reuben Torrey, who had been a student of the great geologist James Dwight Dana at Yale, was the third and final editor of the fundamentals, the periodicals pr printed in the teens that led to the term fundamentalist being used as the term to identify conservative Protestants. And that magazine, The King's Business, from Biola, shows these battleships bombarding the Bible, which of course will stand. These battleships are identified as, among other things, liberal theology, culture, science, hypothesis, atheism, okay? We'll come back to a couple of those. But these are the forces that were seen as battling against fundamentalism. And in the 20s, this controversy then about teaching evolution was inseparable from culture wars. And that's still true. Brian and other self-styled fundamentalists, the term they used for themselves, saw evolution as one of several aspects of modernity that was put the Bible under assault. And that is still true. Now, during the 20s, many of the ideas that Brian was popularizing through stump speeches all across the country and in writing, he and many other fundamentalist leaders shared the same views about evolution. And they were depicted for the ordinary person in very skillfully carried out religious cartoons done by the greatest Christian cartoonist of the age, Ernest James Pace, who wrote who put his cartoons in many periodicals, especially the Sunday School Times, which was a tabloid-style newspaper sent weekly to Protestant Sunday School teachers and pastors across the country. 
And it was a kind of combination, if you will, of the newsy kinds of things that Christianity Today would, would provide with commentary of that type, but in addition, outlines for Sunday school teachers to get ready to teach a class a week or two out at various levels. It doesn't exist any longer. It went defunct in the 60s. But the magazine had a circulation of nearly 100,000 in the 1920s. It was very influential. Pace has put one cartoon a week in there for 30 years. And here, here's many of them deal with, with uh, things having nothing to do with science, but some of them have to do with evolution. And here's one of his earliest ones. And it shows, of course, evolution as the hy Darwinian hypothesis. The word hypothesis is crucial in identifying what it was from the fundamentalist point of view. And it's headed for it's, it's, it's hot air, and it's falling out of clouds of speculation and headed toward a collision with the facts. And the gondola has... It expresses the view that evolution has never been adequately demonstrated. Evolution is simply not true. It's sheer speculation, unsupported, wild speculation. And the gondola of the balloon ex characterizes evolution as science falsely so-called. This is a direct reference to 1 Timothy 6.20, where Paul speaks of, warns Timothy to avoid um, vain babblings and science falsely so-called. The, the Greek word there is gnosis, knowledge. And of course, the English word science, its original meaning was knowledge, broadly speaking. Chaucer uses the word even in the, in the 12th century. Um, that's how old the word is in English. It goes back to the 12th century. But it comes from Middle French and ultimately from Latin, from the verb to know. Science meant knowledge, that which we could be sure about. Not mere opinion, but knowledge. And so science falsely so-called, that biblical phrase is lifted and used against evolution in the 20th century. It had been used in America in the 19th century against the early geology. And if you want to read about that, go to Biologos and read one of my recent columns about the American response to geology in the early 19th century. And you'll see, that, see about that. Now, here's a cartoon Pace did not draw. This is from England. From a London, uh, it was in a, in, a car, in a book by a London journalist named Newman Watts called Why Be an Ape, published in the 1930s. But it reflects the same issues that Americans, uh, Christians, are concerned about. Evolution is just a stack of hypotheses, a stack of guesses. Brian put it this way. Um, the word hypothesis is a synonym used by scientists for the word guess. Okay? This comes from his most influential piece. It's the long speech he delivered all across the country during the anti-evolution campaign called The Menace of Darwinism. And a second statement that he did read to reporters outside the courtroom at the end of the Scopes trial, because the judge, did, the judge ruled out final statements by both attorneys. Brian read his final statement to reporters outside the courtroom, and he said this, evolution is not truth, it is merely an hypothesis. It is millions of guesses strung together. So a hypothesis is a fancy word for guess, meaning unsupported guess, sheer speculation. And evolution is nothing but guesses strung together, brilliantly illustrated in this cartoon. At the same time, public policy implications were present. Many Christians saw the college professoriate as forcing evolutionary beliefs on Christian students and making them abandon their faith. This cartoon shows that brilliantly. The God-denying theory of evolution is being blown toward the rocks of infidelity, being steered there by the professor who's instructed the student to throw the Bible overboard. Many Christians, including Brian, see then today and saw then evolution as a God-denying theory that contradicts the Bible, and in their view, Teaching evolution in public schools violates the constitutional mandate for religious neutrality on the part of the government. It's a very powerful political argument, and it's still on the table today in conversations. And personally, I don't think we're going to solve this because of the First Amendment, because of the received interpretation of the First Amendment. That's another issue. You can ask me about that afterward if you like. But why has evolution been controversial? We've seen some reasons. See some of the same things today. Here is one of the first books by Ken Ham called The Lie, Evolution, a book published back in the 1980s. 
the confrontational attitude that Brian took toward evolution is readily seen today in the work of Ken Ham and his creationist ministry called Answers in Genesis. Almost everyone in the room probably knows who Ken Ham is because you've selected to come to a conference like this. But in case you don't, he is the, the uh, Australian-born uh, former uh, school teacher who is the chief executive officer of Answers in Genesis, the organization that has become, in my opinion, the most influential creationist organization today. Um, they have a large website, and they have this very well-known, fancy, technically impressive creation museum uh, in northern Kentucky, not far from Cincinnati. And that's where this picture was set up. Ken, with uh, one of his associates at the museum, uh, <laughs> is just posing for a photo here. <laughs> because illustrating the view, actually, that humans and dinosaurs coexisted, which is central to Ham's understanding of natural history. That's the large website. Many of you have probably visited that. Uh, but I've chosen this particular homepage for it from some years ago because it illustrates, again, Brian's point that evolution isn't even a theory. It's, uh, it's just sheer speculation. But now there are some interesting differences, important differences between Ham's position and that of William Jennings Bryan. And the evolution of this cartoon, which you'll see again here, will illustrate this. This cartoon comes from the print version of The Lie from the 1980s. And it shows two castles battling one another, the castle of humanism and the castle of Christianity. And as your earlier versions of this cartoon, um, you notice how the castle of evolution is built on the foundation, excuse me, the castle of humanism is built on the foundation of evolution. And evolution, in turn, comes from Satan. That, that's a belief that Henry Morris liked to stress. Uh, the, the most influential of the early generation of creationists in America. In his view, it was entirely plausible that evolution was revealed to Nimrod at Babylon by Satan. Morris says this in his book, in one of his books on evolution from the 1970s. On the right-hand side, the castle of Christianity is based on creation founded on Christ. And of course, the evolutionists are doing the right thing from their point of view, or the humanists. They're firing at the foundation of this castle. Whereas the Christians are either clueless, firing in the wrong direction, firing at the results of humanism, not the cause, or firing at one another. And that, that, that's Ham's perspective from the 1980s. Now notice the subtle change that happens when we get the highly uh, uh, the digital version uh, and colorized version of this cartoon from the early, in this, in this century. A lot of similarity, but there's a change down at the base, isn't there? Um, the change at the base, of course, is now that millions of years equals man as authority. It's now the age of the earth. And on the right-hand side, it's six days equals as God as authority. There's a shift, a significant shift, not that Ham's views have changed at all, they have not, but the way it's being marketed to people, the issue is now the age of the earth is central to this. That was never the case for Brian or any other fundamentalist leader. I can just pretty much say flatly from the 1920s that fundamentalists did not believe in a young earth. Um, they, they were old earth creationists, either of the gap variety or the day age variety. Um, so in the 1920s, the culture wars played a role, they still do today. As you can see here from the balloons, it's, this is about culture wars. Uh, at first, uh, Ken Ham portrayed evolution as satanic in origin, inseparable from these evils. I, I'm sure he still believes that. But now the root problem here is identified as biblical authority, right? When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? That's the text of Psalm 11.3 put into the cartoon. Now, today then, what more could we say about Creationism on the one hand, and intelligent design on the other hand. What can we say about them that might be in common or not in common with what happened before? Well, you've seen some things already, but the most important tenet of scientific creationism, in my opinion, is this one. The belief that the Bible is the only truly reliable source of knowledge about the origin of the Earth and the universe. 
God was the only eyewitness of creation. His authority cannot be questioned or trumped. And so that is what happened. And any other human knowledge must, must bend to God. And the logic is impeccable given that particular view of the Bible. And um, a second point is that the Bible tells us that the earth is young, uh, not much more than about 10,000 years, perhaps 12,000 at the outset, and that all biological kinds, whatever that word might mean, it doesn't translate simply into any modern biological category, were created separately in six 24-hour days not long ago. Mainstream science puts the ages of the Earth in the universe considerably different here in order of magnitude. I just was corrected my number, the number I got a number 4.54 billion years from uh, Ken Walgamuth, who's in the room here, a couple of years ago when he visited Messiah. Ken's an expert on exactly this, science, this kind of thing. And now he tells me this morning it's been up to 4.56, just very recently. Okay, so my slide is out of date. Uh, uh, the cosmological number, I think, is, is, still, is still right, but one of the astronomers in the room can tell me if it's off also by perhaps one of these digits. But, you know, people, when people, people sometimes say that these numbers fluctuate a bit, so why should we believe them? I don't think anybody cares, really, whether it's 4.54 billion or 4.56 billion. I mean, if you suddenly came into that much money, you wouldn't care. <laughs> yeah. But you would care whether it was 4.54 billion versus 6,000. 6,000 wouldn't change your life in quite the same way, okay? So it's the order of magnitude here that matters. It's the order of magnitude, yeah. Now, another tenet of scientific creationism is, <laughs> aha, I see when I edited this last night and I was tired, I left out the word flood. The flood produced many of the fossils during human history. The flood produced many fossils during human history. It used to be the standard view that produced almost all the fossils. Creationists have backed away from that significantly in this generation. They recognize a tremendous amount of genuine evolution, which they won't call that, has happened since the flood, on their view. It has to have happened since the flood to create all of these many, many different kinds of life that couldn't have fit on the ark. And so that, that contemporary creationism is a bit different on this view, but the spirit is the same. And that view is known as flood geology. And of course, it's entirely inconsistent with mainstream geology that this is the case. And uh, furthermore, the fall of Adam and Eve radically altered the laws of nature so that the pre-fall world was different from the post-fall world in which we now live. And the motivation for this is theodicy, as this cartoon indicates here, from answers, this cartoon from Answers in Genesis, that here Adam and Eve are having a conversation in the garden about how good all this is. If they had known about all the predation and, and, and uh, death that, and suffering in the animal kingdom that had happened before they were here, they would not have said that in Ham's view. Um, there was no, no carnivores, no parasi parasites, no disease organisms prior to the fall. The suffering of the creation results, results directly from the sin of Adam and Eve. And that, that view was wrestled through in the 19th century. And when Christians accepted old earth creation, they had re way, already found ways to wrestle with that one satisfactorily. Um, the fundamentalist leaders were not bothered by that. Now, the tone of the conversation here is an important factor. Biologos is really concerned about our tone. We really are. And this matters a lot to us. Um, creationists see alternative interpretations of the Bible as extremely dangerous. And for them, any interpretation that does not involve an acceptance of a recent creation with a literal six days is really a fatal compromise uh, with non-biblical knowledge. And they'll use the terms compromise and accommodation as pejoratives, as illustrated well in the title of this book by Jonathan Sarfati called Refuting Compromise, a book that's, a, that's directed at the old earth creationist Hugh Ross and his interpretation of the scripture, which is, and Ross rejects biological evolution. He thinks there's more acts of separate creation than the, creation, than the young earth creationists actually think there were. Um, but it's, it's, uh, he was seen as a fatal compromise because of his acceptance of a day age view of Genesis. For roughly a century, from roughly the start of the Civil War down to 1960, 
Protestant writers in this country accepted the validity of an old earth and, the, and an old universe. And this is illustrated well in the Schofield Reference Bible, which was the most widely used Bible during that period of, since, 19, since its appearance in the early 20th century, it was the most widely used Bible by conservative Protestants on both sides of the Atlantic in the English speaking world. And that Bible endorsed both the day age and the gap views of Genesis and assumed that one of those two was the best way to go and that the earth was really old and that didn't bother the editor C.I. Schofield uh, from Dallas Seminary, it didn't bother him at all that that was the case. He thought the human creation had taken place just a few thousand years ago, a separate creation, but the rest of creation could be as old as you wanted it to be. Um, and that's a complete change of, from the views of Ham. So where did these creationist views come from into contemporary Christian conversation? Well, they came from Seventh-day Adventist circles. Uh, the, the Adventists um, follow the views of their prophet Ellen White from the 19th century. White taught, among other things, that the creation had been a literal week. Um, she had visions of various things uh, behind her writings. She would have these trance-like visions in which she believed God revealed truths to her. And one of these visions was about the creation week. She said she was carried back to the creation and shown that the first week in which God performed the work of creation in six days and rested on the seventh was just like every other week. And it is from her influence indirectly through other Adventist writers especially through the work of the Canadian school teacher George McCready Price, that the ideas of the Adventist way of thinking about this made its way out of that sectarian group that thinks all other Christians are heretics for worshiping Christ and God on Sunday into mainstream conservative Presbyterian, uh, Presbyterian right, conservative um, Protestant words. I'm a Presbyterian, I'm using the word Protestant is what the word I wanted to use. Um, and that happened in the 1960s. It happened owing to the work of the late Henry Morris on our left and John C. Whitcomb on our right. That's a long story I don't have time to tell. The short version is simply that Whitcomb and Morris were both deeply influenced by Price. And, and in, the, in, the, in the published version of their work in the 1960s, the influence of Price is hidden as far as possible. There's very brief references to Price when a large amount of the material is inspired by Price. And it, it's, uh, but they didn't think it would be very helpful to be marketing ideas of the Seventh-day Adventist into larger Christian circles. Now, intelligent design is a different perspective than creationism. I do not agree with most scholars who think it's just a form of creationism. I'm not going to go into that. You can ask me about that afterward if you like. But in the intelligent design movement, was effectively begun by Berkeley law professor Philip Johnson, um, who's now retired and sadly in failing health. Um, but Philip Johnson, whose discipline really is rhetoric as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a law professor, has persuaded many American Christians to take a different view of these issues that has certain similarities with the old earth creationism of William Jennings Bryan. And in fact, that they're both attorneys is interesting, too. Um, but the, the major center for support for the, the, this, these views is the Discovery Institute in Seattle, which is not fundamentally about ID, but it has a wing devoted to this. It's about many other issues as well. <clears throat> and concerning the Bible, here's what ID thinkers think. This surprises many Christians when I tell them this, but this is, this is very accurate. The Bible is not to be mentioned in this conversation. Likewise, God, or theology. This is why the intelligent designer is discussed. Um, the intelligent designer is mentioned, but not identified. And you don't want to use the word God for that in this movement in your public face. And you don't want to talk about theology, even if you are doing it. And you don't want to talk about the Bible. Now, why is that the case? Well, that's a deliberate strategy for legal reasons, because of the First Amendment to the American Constitution. Because in the 1980s, there were federal court and Supreme Court rulings consistently saying that creationism, that meaning scientific creationism, could not be taught in public school science classes. That it was religion, not science, and that it was a violation of 
the separation of church and state to do that. So opponents of evolution took a different strategy with intelligent design. And they want, proponents of ID want to ensure they're not perceived as advocates of creationism. Johnson himself put it this way in an interview in the Christian magazine Touchstone um, more than 20 years ago. Here's what he said. The first thing that has to be done is to get the Bible out of the discussion. And then he goes on to elaborate on that in that expanded statement there. It's not that it, he doesn't think it's important. He does. But that's not, that's not where you start. You start by getting the Bible out of the conversation and going with philosophy, science, other things. Proponents of ID also believe, as we would at Biologos too, that objects, the universe itself, and objects that compose it exhibit abundant evidence of having been designed by an intelligent designer. Um, but that's used as a, as, a, as a way of attacking evolution, which is what Biologos doesn't do. And they view the, the, these things in the universe as we do as not products of blind chance. Um, as far as the age of the Earth and those biblical issues about the flood, other such things, those are good issues to talk about, many in the ID movement would say, but not as part of intelligent design, because intelligent design, remember, is not about the Bible. It's about the science. It's not about the Bible. So those conversations can happen when the other shoe drops later. Now, that's not creationism in the normal sense, as you've seen. You get the Bible out of the conversation. You don't start with the Bible. You start with other things. But nevertheless, the tone of intelligent design really does resemble classical creationism very closely when it comes to cultural issues. For example, this InterVarsity Press book dedicated to um, Philip Johnson, entitled Darwin's Nemesis, the, the preface was written by William Dembski, a leading intelligent design theorist, and here's what he said. This is shortly after the Kitzmiller versus Dover trial, the famous intelligent design trial that took place in Harrisburg, 15 miles from my home involving a school district 15 miles in the other direction from the school district one south of where I live. And because of Kitzmiller v. Dover, school boards and state legislators may trade, tread more cautiously, but tread on evolution they will. The culture war demands it. A leading intelligent design person making direct reference to the culture war in this sense. So that's just one example of many I could offer of the tone here. So the tone is very similar. And evolution is also Darwinism in intelligent design. The term Darwinism has two meanings. One meaning of the term Darwinism is Darwinian evolution by natural selection. The other meaning is the worldview of naturalism and anti-religion. That's a second meaning. Um, but they're both important in the intelligent design movement. And so the tone of their conversation about evolution has all these overtones about culture wars. So the final question then, does evolution deny orthodox Christianity? Well, Brian, of course, would have said absolutely yes. For him, theistic evolution, he himself speaks of theistic evolution. That's a term that goes back to the 1870s. And Brian says theistic evolution is an anesthetic which deadens the pain while the patient's religion is being gradually removed. Okay, so. Uh, evolution is a wedge which splits apart biblical faith. He also described it as a way station on the highway that leads from Christian faith to no God land, that is to atheism, to atheism. That is dramatically illustrated in this cartoon by Pace, which was conceived by Brian. This cartoon is drawn by Ernest James Pace, that great cartoonist, but the idea for it comes straight from Brian, from a letter he wrote to the editor of the Sunday School Times the year before the Scopes trial in 1924. When he says that, it's the letters in the Library of Congress, and he says that the cartoon I have in mind, says Brian, would represent evolution as we believe it to be, namely he and the editor of the Sunday School Times. Namely, he says, as the cause of modernism, meaning religious liberalism, the cause of modernism and of the vital, of the progressive elimination of the vital truths of the Bible. And he says, the cartoon will show three well-dressed men going down a staircase on which there is no stopping place, namely a slippery slope, a staircase on which there is no stopping point. And that's what he thinks it is. And you can see the elements of the staircase. It leads from 
doubting the Bible to doubting the divinity of Jesus. No, deity means divinity of Jesus. To doubting the atonement to doubt, and doubting the resurrection and doubting the existence of God. That this is the slippery slope through which the Christian goes when they accept evolution. This is an inevitable series. Brian liked to use Darwin himself as an example of a person in this category. And so there's, again, there's no stopping place on this. Richard Dawkins fully agrees with this. Um, evolution leads people out of religious faith. It, it's a key thing to raise against religion. And those of you familiar with Dawkins' work know that he views all kinds of religion as a virus that needs to be eradicated. But he seems to have a, a, a special uh, uh, distaste for Christianity. Um, and he'll write about this in his many books. So on the wings, you know, you have da Brian and his, his friends thinking that evolution leads to atheism, and Dawkins thinking the same thing. Indeed, Rich, uh, Will Provine, a professor of evolutionary biology at Cornell, who has had Philip Johnson in his class to talk to students on multiple occasions. Will Provine, who is like Dawkins, an evolutionary atheist, is convinced that evolution is the greatest engine of atheism ever invented. That's what he has said. So this is, this is a very widespread view in our culture. And this, you know, it's not just the creationists who think this. Now, on the other hand, you, you have an example like this, where Bishop Spong, John Spong, a retired Episcopal Bishop of Newark, uh, there, there's a text in the scripture where Jesus says, can any good thing come out of Newark? Um, <laughs> but in any case, um, Bishop Spong has written a number of books about this. He's a member of the Jesus Seminar. And he thinks Christianity has to abandon theism if it's going to continue to exist in the, in the modern world. Why Christianity Must Change or Die is only one of several books with this type of a theme to it. He thinks he knows a lot about science and religion, but frankly, he knows nothing about science and religion. Um, he knows a lot about theology and a lot about the Bible. But you know, he thinks this is what modernity means. You must give up theism in order to go forward in this conversation. Now, those are pretty radical views. And they, they, the people who think that mean that, indeed, does evolution deny orthodox Christianity? It absolutely does, according to Brian, according to Dawkins, according to John Spong, and many other writers in our culture. According to this writer, Francis Collins, it does not. You all know who Francis Collins is. Many of you may know who John Polkinghorne is, the English particle physicist, a world-class scientist, fellow of the Royal Society who has written one of my many books on science and faith, including this one. I picked out this one, The Faith of a Physicist, published in the US by Princeton University Press, because it's a commentary on the Nicene Creed, which, which, which Polkinghorne believes without crossing his fingers. And this is, this is a, you know, he's, a, he's an evolutionist. He fully accepts evolution and other aspects of modern science. But he also is a Trinitarian Christian who affirms the Nicene Creed. Robert John Russell one of the great scholars of Christianity of science in the world, a physicist and minister, Protestant minister, who's written many, many works of a Trinitarian nature, talking about the relation between science and faith, would class, affirm the classical affirmations, creation from nothing, the bodily resurrection of Jesus, the divinity of Jesus. And yet he's a, he fully accepts evolution as well. Or another example, Owen Gingerich, the Harvard astronomer and astrophysicist who is also an historian of science, recently writing books on science and faith for the ordinary person, especially God's universe and his latest is God's planet that's just recently come out, um, putting into the book subtly but clearly incarnational Christianity, the salvation through Christ, in books about science, here's a traditional Christian who also fully accepts evolution and modern science. Well, ironically, for millions of American Christians, the ideas of Collins and Polkinghorn, and Russell and Gingrich are no more acceptable than those of Richard Dawkins. They do, however, represent a significant new feature on the historical landscape 
Uh, these are world-class scientists and theologians who accept evolution, but who also affirm the incarnation and the bodily resurrection of Jesus. These are thinkers who did not descend William Jennings Bryan's staircase of unbelief. There were no people like that in the 1920s that I could tell you by name who they were. People of that magnitude in their fields who accepted evolution and who were classical Christians. The conversation was enormously polarized within Christian churches and I think even more than today. Believe it or not, I think that's the case. Um, and there was no one like them out there in the 1920s. Well, finally, will voices like these have a permanent effect on the conversation? Will attitudes and ideas from them, or ideas like them, be accepted by American Christians more coming down the road? Well, you've asked the wrong guy. I'm a historian. I'm not a prophet. I can't, I can't tell you how this is going to play out. But I do think, historically, it's significant to note that this is different. This is, this is a significant change from the situation at the time of the Scopes trial. And it could prove to be significant in the long run. I certainly hope so. Thank you for your attention.